So last time I, I showed that there wasn't enough power, there wasn't enough time, and there wasn't enough ability to synchronize without destroying things in the ceramic speed drivetrain, the, the new one called Driven. The concept that they showed off that couldn't shift last year. Well, using synchros, and what, and, and what synchros are, are a method to adjust the speed of something. So when you are in a manual vehicle and you press in on the clutch and you put it into neutral before it gets to the next gear you're placing it in, you have a shaft and you have this collar and once it goes back to that neutral position, there's a little bit of friction between them and they speed up and then they match speeds. The gears are constantly meshed and they have little slots in them or other mechanisms that when you shift gears next, that gear is going and it just slides right into existing holes that then forces the gear ahead when, when you let out on the clutch. The same concept can be used for the ceramic speed driven drivetrain. The difference is that we're not using constant synchro mesh. We're actually kind of like what they call straight cut movable gears used in rally cars sliding in and out. So it's a bit more difficult to get them together, but what we'll actually see in the math is that the synchros actually provide a very viable solution to make the ceramic speed drivetrain actually function. So with this design, we would have the same bearing carrier and as it slides out, it would be disconnected from the, the drive shaft and then it would eventually touch this little high area between it and it would speed up to the speed it needs to be going so that it can slot in. And it's still possible that a bearing might hit, but there's some mechanical stuff that will help guide them. And we don't really need to worry about that. That is mechanical stuff that has been figured out in vehicles and other things. We just wanna know the viability and the impact on your drivetrain. So we're already going out of velocity. So the stereotypical high school physics example of pushing on a box and you have this static friction that is holding it in place. And once you overcome that, your friction actually drops to this lower kinetic friction, lower in most cases. But because we're already spinning when we engage in that, we're already in a kinetic friction region. There is already slip happening. So we don't really have to worry about that. So we can make a lot of simplifying assumptions to do this math. So 40 kilometers an hour again, 12 bearings, 12 grams of bearing. Um, chosen for 15 to 14 teeth and I mathed out for some of the stuff uh, because we need some gaps some meat on those um, the gear that's on the wheel we need to have um, some spacing between them and that resulted in a radius of about five centimeters so just like with force uh, you can you know it's equal to mass times acceleration for something that is moving, when your sum of your forces, it's the same thing here. The sum of your torques is equal to your moment of inertia times your angular acceleration. So we need that moment of inertia for that little spinning bit. And I made a few assumptions here. Instead of just assuming they, they each have, have their own moment of inertia, I assumed that they were point masses. And this actually helps around speed. It decreases the moment of inertia. So a point mass, a uh, specified distance away from the axis. This is all symmetric so that we know where that axis is. It means we have 12 bearings, 12 grams, five centimeters squared away. And because there's a bunch of stuff we miss because that simplification, I'm just going to arbitrarily double it. We'll see, it actually doesn't hurt ceramic speed whatsoever. So let's say eight times 10 to the minus four kilogram meter squared. This is a really small number. And it makes sense. There's not a lot of mass there. It's all very confined in a very small area. If I put that same mass very far out, this number goes up, put it really close together like this in this design, it's very little. So because of these teeth, we know that there is a speed differential. It's not going to be big. If we actually work it out based on those teeth and the speed that we're going, it's actually only a 7.14% 7 Differential. So whatever our omega nu minus our omega ol divided by time is our average acceleration. And because we know our speed we're going at, we can work that all out that the wheel's spinning at about 33.3 radians per second. 
and not surprisingly, um, put that in for our omega old once we redo that math, divide it by how long a shift will take, and I'm assuming 300 milliseconds for the total shift time, 100 milliseconds for engage and disengage the drivetrain, and 200 milliseconds for the shift uh, gives us 11.9 meters per second squared. Or sorry, radians per second squared. We're in a rotational universe here. So that's actually not that much. It's, it's pretty simple to achieve that. So now we have our uh, moment of inertia. We have our angular acceleration. We can all put them together and find out what torque it requires for 200 milliseconds to spin that up to get it to the right speed. So we work that all out and we get 9.513 times 10 to the minus three Newton meters. This is a very, very small, 0. 0.000, that was an extra zero, one uh, Newton meters, so 0. 0.001 uh, Newton meters. So just like we did before, uh, we had all those components, we know the time it takes, we know how fast things are going, we know that the energy for the shift is actually going to come from our drivetrain. So it's actually going to slow our bike down as it speeds this up through energy loss. So the power is equal to torque times omega. We knew what our omega was. We know what our torque is. And it's 0.31 watts. But keep in mind, that's only during those 200 milliseconds that we're actually shifting. So we, let's figure out what the average would be. And I'm going to beat up on ceramic speed here a little because I'm figuring the disengaging and re-engaging is going to take at least the same amount of energy. So we have 0.3 watts, 0.2 seconds, two times for the disengage, re-engage, extra, 120 shifts, and all over 3,600 seconds in an hour. 0 0.04 watts. There's, this is nothing. This is absolutely tiny. So this shows how the synchromethic can actually speed up and slow down um, and enable shifting to actually happen. I mean, the only thing we really need to account for is the fact that you are physically decoupled, just like when you press a clutch, and there's a period of time where you're going to spin your legs and no torque is going to go to your drivetrain. But obviously that can't be any meaningful amount. I mean, the 120 shifts in an hour, um, times the 250 watts that you would have been putting down for that time. And I mean, because I'm not a pro, I won't have like, you know, 10th of a second timing at this. I'll have to give myself a second because one third of it is used for shifting and 3,600 seconds. I mean, the average net effect is only a loss of 8.3 watts. I'm, I mean, and that's for 250 watts. I mean, that's only the equivalent of losing, I mean, 3.3% efficiency. Oh, oh, that's a lot. Okay, hold on. If I was a pro, I could probably get this whole scenario down to like half a second. 0.3 of a second to shift, 0.1 of a second to get ready, keep my legs going, accelerate them to the right velocity, engage them and stuff. Um, oh, shoot, that's 4.2 watts. Still, I mean, if I have a 99% efficient drivetrain, and minus 1.7% effective efficiency. That's, I guess I better carry the two there. So that's uh, only 97.3% efficient. And if I'm not a pro, it's worse. And if I just lube my chain, I'd have be at 98. Lube my chain with wax, complicated synchro arrangement. Hmm. Well, suffice to say, the synchros are a way of enabling the ceramic speed drivetrain to work. Just the reality is math doesn't work out on that.